Hello, this is Teuta, and you're watching Learn Channel. I am thrilled to announce the official launch of Learn Channel, a Leoron Institute TV style show with your learning needs in mind. Learn TV is a unique project focusing on the latest developments in the learning industry, which we hope to cascade down our viewers throughout a series of informative pieces, expert roundups, interviews, and relevant finding across the industry. We cover educational technology, e-learning, learning development, training, consulting, coaching, and much more. We cover the entire Gulf, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar. In fact, today we are airing our first episode, and we have invited two guests. With us in the studio is Managing Director at Leoron Institute, and later via Zoom, we will welcome one of our expert trainers. They will help us go through a string of topics that are echoing in the learning reel. George and Stain are seasoned industry experts who have so much to share as they have been basically breathing L&D for over a decade now. So if there is anything puzzling your mind, we invite you to tune in. George, uh, welcome. Thank you. Good pleasure to be here. George, the pandemic uh, created a real havoc in the business world. Many companies barely survived uh, and in the ones who are still working today had to adopt new process in order for them to continue doing business. Mm. How did the COVID-19 pandemic uh, affect L&D according to your observation? It affected it greatly, both in a negative sense and a positive one. Uh, negatively, especially in the beginning where companies were reluctant in spending uh, part of their budgets uh, on learning and development, uh, especially with the, all the uncertainty that was going on. But later on, much more positively in a sense that it accelerated, first of all, the digital transformation among both providers and buyers. It accelerated the adaptation of companies into the learning in uh, numerous formats, whether it's uh, blended learning, online, self-paced or live virtual. And it really pushed companies to implement a, a training technology and uh, opening doors for a global competition uh, in that sense. And uh, it encouraged also all the leadership uh, within companies to really invest in upskilling their own people, also uh, in terms of retention purposes, uh, but at the same time making sure uh, that their previously designed training plans were going ahead as planned. Uh, in that sense, during this time, Leoron Institute had experienced growth in our overall number of learners mm -hmm. to the tune of about 93% last year, which was approximately 20,500 learners overall. That's really impressive. Um, we observed also numerous trends in the L&D realm, such as upskilling, reskilling, micro-learning, learning engagement, and others. Mm -hmm. Is there a dominant trend in L&D we can identify here? Uh, the most dominant one that I would uh, again say is the learning technology and going mm. digital. Uh, we are all now adapted to online learning, but uh, it will undoubtedly be an area of uh, further expansion in the years to come. Uh, learning management systems at companies now need to sort of integrate and address some of the key learner and manager needs, such as assessments, uh, gamification, course assignments, corporate enrollment, and so on. Uh, this was also one of the reasons why we at Leron Institute uh, propelled our own LMS platform called Talim, which is addressing these needs and is also provided, uh, uh, comes free for all our corporate clients. And that was one of the reasons why uh, exactly we had 85% of the Leron uh, training del being delivered, 85% uh, as digital and 15% only as on-site this past year. A lot is being said on the importance of developing personal and professional uh, capabilities to maintain a healthier organizational culture. To what extent can this be attributed to learning and development in a way to help maintain strong and unified company culture? Well, uh, the great resignation or how it's globally now called has affected a lot of businesses. Uh, and the companies that had a proper learning and development roadmaps suffered the least when it comes to lower attrition rates. Uh, it was seen as a sign that the company still cares about the employee's development during these even turbulent times. Mm -hmm. And uh, we even at Leoron packaged a few uh, certain training programs for our clients to really tackle that problem of retention uh, uh, successfully. Uh, flexibility, uh, remote work, 
has been Im lately quite important uh, in many industries, but at the same time providing a real challenge when it comes to, uh, like you said, maintaining a strong and unified company culture, uh, especially without that physical connection. Mm, trainings and investments in upskilling your employees has been a great tool uh, and incentive for employees to stay with the company mm -hmm. uh, when it's done right. But you know, doing it right means it being customized, it being tailored where empl employers take into consideration uh, the employee's career path, uh, their gaps, and uh, subject them to training programs to really seek to accelerate their personal and professional growth. Uh, when it comes to data analytics, George, uh, what do you think? How much will the utilization of data analytics for capturing uh, return on investment of learning initiatives be used? Massively. Uh, data is the future and proper data analytics is what already drives decision making in many businesses. Uh, it started maybe initially from financial aspect to making business decisions based on the same and then trickling down to every single department, including human resources and L&D. Uh, the biggest challenge as an L&D professional is always to show a return on the mm -hmm. funds invested uh, so that we can actually prove impact uh, in order to encourage even more investments in the same. Uh, it's done through various uh, pre-course, during-course, post-course activities and the uh, data and utilizing the same from each of these to create a certain report that effectively proves impact is very important and uh, you know, guarantees that return on investment. George, thank you for your elaborated uh, answers. My pleasure. And uh, now we will connect with our guest, who is an expert trainer, Stane Hackrod, um, which is online with us via Zoom. Stane, hello. Thanks for being uh, with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Stane, I would like to ask you, based on your experience, what new skills will trainers need to be in order to be uh, successful this year? I think the kind of skills that trainers are going to need is much more related to their character than necessarily subject matter expertise or, or the ability to teach or train. Um, I think things like flexibility uh, of character will be very much needed as clients change their preferred way in which they want their people to be trained, be that uh, live virtual training sessions, hybrid, uh, asynchronous models, digitization, or whether they still want them in the classroom. Um, and clients have a habit of, of changing these depending on uh, what is possible. Uh, we're still in an intra-pandemic uh, phase, so we sometimes have clients that they want it in the room, but then they have to cancel and go digital. So trainers need to be flexible to adapt and change to what it is that clients want. Uh, it, there might also be cost considerations. Uh, clients might uh, have a lower spend and they want to spend that on maybe an asynchronous or a hybrid model as opposed to incurring the cost of actually physically getting trainers into the room. So I think much more to the character of trainers uh, when we look at the kind of skills that they're going to need to be successful. Flexibility, new methods of engagement, uh, really learning the skill of how to engage participants online. Uh, new content also even, uh, radically new content because a lot has changed in terms of the various subjects and topics of training that we have been trained uh, for decades. Stain, hard skills and soft skills for employees, are these terms uh, still relevant? I'm very, I'm very glad you asked me that question because I think very few people actually know where the term soft skill comes from. I think most people think that when we talk about soft skills, we just refer to leadership training. Um, which is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, soft skills and hard skills is actually something that dates back to the nine, late 1960s. Between the time of 1968 and 1972, the US military started to get machines to do the work of soldiers. Uh, and they, they, they then uh, allowed soldiers to engage with machines. And where it was initially thought that this would yield higher performance and higher success on the battlefield, it was actually not the case. The fact that somebody, for instance, could use a map or read a map as a hard skill, a technical skill, didn't necessarily guarantee the performance of a platoon on the battlefield. So um, there were three criteria that they looked at at the time, and the one was the degree of interaction with uh, a machine, for instance. The other one was the, the actual degree of performance. And then the third one was, you know, they would take a, a typical job situation. Like, let, let's use the example of a map, for instance. Using a map 
was classified and categorized as a hard skill. Explaining how to use the map, motivating others how to use the map, um, allowing for accountability and decision making when others use the map. That's an entirely different skill set. And what was found at the time is that this needed to be expanded in, it was more, it became more important for levels of performance of a platoon or a battalion even, even for the leaders to be able to motivate others, to explain to them how to use certain things and then to get them to be accountable in using that in, in, in the aspect of, uh, of decision making. So certainly hard and soft skills as a term, I believe would remain. I just think that we need to make it clear that soft skill as, as, as a leadership skill is not, is not soft as in easy. Mm -hmm. It is actually um, derived, why, why, where the word soft comes from is it was not working with a machine. A machine was, was seen to be a hard thing, a hard tangible thing. Mm -hmm. That's where hard skills come from and soft was working with people. But certainly in the future, yes, I believe that both these skills uh, are of high importance for levels of success going forward. I, I actually, thank you, thank you, Stane. I actually want to ask George as well. George, going further with the question, what do you think, what will organizations focus on in 2022, on soft skills training or technical uh, skills training? Uh, well, in my opinion, uh, it, it has to be a, a good combination of both, mm. absolutely. Uh, the hard skills, as uh, Stane so eloquently explained, or the technical skills, are more geared towards the individual, uh, the, the, on the professional side of their uh, competency levels. And uh, sometimes we've seen in our industry that it's more uh, focused on potential certifications that are uh, uh, within a certain sector. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas on the soft skill side or behavioral training, uh, there is also a, a very big increase because that also targets a broad number of uh, participants within a certain organization. It touches more on the personal characteristics uh, of a person. Uh, and I, th I see an interest in both uh, equally. Uh, but at the same time, you know, one is targeting uh, in, in one area and on the soft skill side, I, th I see it more of a, uh, in terms of volume, just maybe slightly uh, bigger there. Back uh, to Stain. Everything, Stain. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Um, Stain, everything from the house, the city and the state you live in, the weather in your area, the social climate, and your work environment, we know that can affect our mental health. Do you think that organizations should implement uh, mental health training as part of their post-pandemic corporate training curriculum? Look, I believe that uh, organizations has a responsibility to care for their employees, period. Mm. I, I don't think that uh, one should necessarily categorize it uh, by means of uh, mental health programs. Certainly mental health programs, I believe, has a great need and value and relevance right now. But I think what precedes uh, the rollout uh, and the initiation of mental health programs is organizations simply just caring for their people. Mm -hmm. You know, as organizations, uh, we don't just uh, operate on an organizational level, we, we operate on a societal level, which means that you care about the people that work for you. If you have staff that work for you, are you aware of their accommodation? Uh, you know, what is the nature of their accommodation? How long does it take for them to get to work uh, in the mornings? Uh, you know. Sometimes uh, business leaders tend to think that when people rush out at five o'clock it's because they're not motivated or they only want to work until five o'clock. No, a lot of times it is because they have to catch a bus right. and it's going to take them two or three hours to get back to their place of residence. You know, so I think, yes, definitely uh, there's a need for, for mental health programs. I would just like to say that I, I wouldn't want organizations to think that a mental health program in itself is enough to show that care. I think we need a deep-rooted care, uh, high levels of empathy with our employees in terms of uh, the challenges and struggles that they are going through. Um, so that, 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 that is almost to me, more important than just the initiative of a mental health program. I think we need to look at uh, learning and development much more holistically. Yes, it is about our knowledge base, our levels of expertise, but it's also about the heart, uh, the soul, and even the body. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. nothing. Sure. Uh, prevents us from also incorporating some sort of 
you know, let's say a fitness uh, initiative along with our uh, learning and development programs, you know, get people to start walking or cycling or whatever, because you know what they say, healthy body, healthy mind. <laughs> yes. That's my view on it. Healthy life in the end. Um, Stain, we would like our in -viewer, uh, viewers to understand how can corporate training uh, have a significant impact on the productivity of the employees? I, I, look, learning and development as a standalone has uh, a, a, a slim chance of success in an organization and a slim chance of increasing productivity. What is required for these initiatives to be successful is buy-in and sponsorship from the top leadership in an organization. And when I say top leadership, I'm talking CEO, uh, chairman, uh, managing director level, from that level downwards. Not just uh, uh, a, a, a involvement, but an active engagement. Uh, we run a number of uh, uh, programs through Leron where we would engage the leadership of those organizations. When we, for instance, have participants in the room, we will have a contextualization session with the leader of the organization, sharing perspectives uh, uh, of the learning outcomes of a program and how that fits into the organization. So in terms of levels of productivity, it still comes from leaders that's able to motivate and to influence their employees to uh, be more empowered, more accountable, uh, take more chances, take more risks, uh, be more courageous to take decisions. Learning and development certainly complements that productivity, but ultimately the buy-in from senior management is a key requirement. A lot of being said on the importance of developing professional and personal uh, capabilities to maintain uh, health or organizational culture, as you mentioned. It's commonly believed such support leads to overall employees' happiness. To what extent can this be attributed to learning and development? Oh, I think there's a key connection between learning and development and, you know, what I call the happiness center of employees. I think, again, you know, if we talk about establishing a kind of a culture in an organization and the role that, that learning and development plays in it, good leaders know what drives the happiness of the employees. And what drives the happiness of, of employees is not a bonus at the end of the year. Yes, that certainly helps. You know, mm -hmm. it, it maybe pays for an additional installment on the home loan or the car, or it gives you that uh, dream holiday and make it, make it, makes it a little bit more affordable. But that's, that's not the motivator. That's a reward for hard work. Good leaders know what drives the happiness of the employees is when they feel that they are part of a larger community, when they feel that they are part of a family, when they feel that what they say and what they do matters and it is valued. And in that sense, uh, what is important is that business leaders establish some kind of a purpose for an organization. If the organization has a purpose like Leron has a purpose to develop, uh, educate, and learn, uh, uh, enhance the abilities of employees so that organizations can move forward, so that societies can move forward, so that nations can move forward, then, then it works. So in terms of the link between learning and development and establishing of this culture, very important. But again, learning and development will be a complementary role a complementary addition to leaders that understand that what drives the happiness of my employees is purpose. And if an, a leader then shows the belief in that purpose by investing in learning and development, that makes employees very happy. It makes them want to work, makes them want to serve that organization because they see that that provision of learning and development is a way in which the leaders of that organization actually serves them. True. Uh, in, in, thank you, Stane, for your answer. In the end, I have two. I have a question for for George as well, and for you as well. Um, I'll, I'm going to start with George, uh, asking him what should we expect uh, for the future of corporate training in 2022. Uh, well, short term, in terms of 20, 2022, uh, the expectation is to have a hopefully some sort of a, a bigger return on the. Uh, on-site or face-to-face -face trainings. Uh, I do see in the future, as explained earlier, that there would be an expansion when it comes to digital learning. Uh, 
uh, now that companies are feeling comfortable with it, see the benefits of the same, see its uh, versatility. So there will be an expansion there. But on the short term, uh, I think a lot of the companies, a lot of the people are eager to have that human touch, that human connection within uh, training. So uh, an increase in on-site trainings, uh, traveling, hopefully, uh, health permitting. Uh, so that's, that's the short term vision on a corporate side. True. In your perspective, stay. What should we I, I think we're heading for a very interesting time. There's a couple of things that's going to happen. I think first and foremost, the market is going to regulate itself. You have a lot of players in the field of learning and development uh, these days because of digitization. It's possible for someone in a garage with a link and a couple of followers to start to offer coaching or training of some sort. Um, and, and yes, even though that you know might be good for accessibility and increase in competition, it does place a question mark over the quality of some of the training that we are seeing on a digital platform. And I think it will be a matter of time. The market will regulate itself. The stronger players, uh, the ones that offer proper certification and has proper quality standards in place, whether they train virtually or in the room, um, they, will, they will maintain and probably increase uh, strength of position because, like I say, the market will, will regulate itself. The debate on, uh, you know, what is the most, uh, you know, what the, what's the most effective in terms of LVT, uh, digital or in the classroom, I think we're going to see a lot of that debate still in 2022. When we look at a value proposition, there's three things we look at. We look at affordability, convenience and effectiveness. Certainly online is more affordable. It's more convenient. Whether it is necessarily more effective, I think that debate uh, will be hammered out in 2022 amongst companies. And then from a, from a what do we expect content perspective, I think we're going to see some, some programs that, off, that, that, that talks to true transformation of organizational leadership. I think there's a lot of clean white canvases out there that needs to be rewritten. We need to start over, go back to, go back to the beginnings and really see how we need to manage and lead our organizations going forward rethinking some of the existing paradigms that we've been working with for a long time, which simply is not adequate or sufficient anymore. Um, definitely an increase in hybrid experience. And I think uh, some levels on the good side, uh, increased levels of self-learning, self-learning discipline and higher levels of accountability. That's what I foresee for 2022. Thank you, Stay. Gentlemen, thank you very much for all the information you shared with us. Uh, and thanks for being part of this show. It was a real pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sticking with us in our first video. There is more of this coming in the next days. In fact, the Learn channel will air up to five times a week. You can tune in for viewing more live stream on LinkedIn or recorded session on our YouTube channel. We strive to cover all the phases of the learning industry, educational technology, e-learning, learning and development, training, consulting, coaching, corporate learning, individual and more. So the blend of the topics is very diverse. And if there is anything you deem important but we haven't managed to cover, just drop us a message and we will review it with our team. Until next time, stay tuned.